churches in the book of Revelation that we're looking at, and uh, Lord willing, next week we're going to look at Thyatira, and um, Jesus had a lot to say to that church, but before that, uh, today is uh, Back to Church Sunday, and as I look around, I think some thought it was Miss Church Sunday, but, uh, but you're here, and I'm glad you are, um, and uh, all of you who are guests today, I just want to say thank you for coming. We are so blessed to have you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, next week, Lord willing. Back to Church Sunday, as has been mentioned, is a Sunday that is set aside nationally uh, to encourage people to get back in church. And um, what I like to say to people is that my goal for you is not to get you in church. Ultimately, my goal for you is to get you to who? To Jesus. That, that's our goal. And so don't allow the address of our church to be the end of your evangelism, okay? Let the uh, end of your desire to evangelize people around you and bring them to, to, to Christ to be seeing them not just saved, but walking in maturing faith in Jesus Christ, growing faith. That's what it's all about, amen? And uh, so I praise God for that. What a great step in that direction though, right? What a great step, bringing people uh, into a place where Others know Christ and uh, glorify Christ, and hopefully uh, their lives will be impacted by Christ. We're so, so thankful that that can happen here. So I want to talk to you this morning um, about basically the theme of this Back to Church Sunday. And uh, the theme this year is a place to belong, a place to belong. Um, have you ever been somewhere where you knew you truly didn't belong? You ever do that? go someplace, uh, or you're around some people, and inside you just want to run away because you know you didn't fit there. You know, you didn't belong there. Um, I, I've had that, had that happen to me. Actually, I had it happen again just recently. Last week, last Sunday, my family and I were gone. We went to Canada for a week and uh, helped some missionaries there, and it was an exciting, exciting time, wonderful time. But you know, there's something sobering about coming to that place about 50 miles north of the Mackinac Bridge. And that Mackinac Bridge is in that state that we won't mention uh, to, the, to the Michigan. I knew, I'm sorry. Uh, but 50 miles or so north of the Mackinac Bridge, you come to uh, a place where you cannot go any further without stopping. And uh, that's called the border of another country. And it had been a long time since I crossed the border of another country. And... Uh, there's some things that I found out about being in a place where uh, it wasn't home. Uh, one of the things I found out is you do what they say and don't ask questions or they will keep you there a long time. Thankfully, they didn't keep us, but I've heard a lot of stories that they keep people. Another thing that I found out is that their money's not our money. And they like it when you pay with our money, right? Uh, I found that out. I found out that they talk funny up there. Eh? right? And I've been pretty good. I was practicing while I was up there. I've lost that accent already, but uh, anyway, so listening to them talk, it's just, the, the longer that we were there, the more, I, I really like the area. It's a beautiful area, wonderful people, but man, many, many times a thought crossed my mind, this is just strange. I just feel like an outsider. You know, we Americans are proud, aren't we? We, we go places and we think everybody should be like us, and then when you go somewhere else where nobody's like you or very few people are like you, uh, you find that uh, you're out of place and you don't necessarily feel like you totally belong. You know, the gospel uh, is not just a place. And when I say the gospel, I mean the end of the gospel. When, when people hear the gospel, respond to the gospel, and they are introduced into this thing called the church, uh, the gospel is not just a place where people come to believe in a person. Okay? Now, most of us, how many of you heard the gospel for the first time in a church? You remember when, you, when it actually clicked in your mind. You were in a church when you heard the gospel. That, that's, that's very common. You either heard the gospel in a church or more than likely, I'm 99% sure here, you heard the gospel from somebody who went to church, right? And so in the world's mind and in the, in the, in the minds of people outside of the church, um, oftentimes they look at the church, they look at this assembly of people as a place where you come to learn about somebody, about Jesus, right? And that's true. 
But I would submit to you this morning that the church is more than just a place where you can learn to believe in a person, but it's a place to belong. The gospel does vastly more than give us a belief in a person. It gives us a place to belong. And, and I believe Paul supports this uh, in Ephesians chapter 2. And if you want to turn there in your Bibles, you can. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 19 through 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. We're going to read Paul's words here and then have prayer and hopefully unpack this a little bit. All right? Let's read this together. It's also on the screen there, if you can, if you can see it. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are, among, you are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the, the privilege of being a part of your church. We thank you that your, this church, this place that we gather together is more than just a place to learn about a person. We know that knowing Jesus is eternal life. He said it himself. But Lord, we also believe that it's a place where we can belong, a place that in the midst of a dark world around us that we can find others who uh, connect with each other through the light of the power of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and that you would open our minds today. And, Lord, help us to make sure that, uh, to the best of our ability, we remind the world around us that there is a place for them and uh, that the, the kingdom of God is for them as well. And, Lord, remind us that we should never become comfortable sitting at the table of our king, but, Lord, that we should be constantly aware of the fact that there are many, many, many around us hundreds, thousands, millions, and even billions across this world who don't know. And uh, Lord, we have the answer. And so Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. 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 Paul says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners, you're citizens, along with all of God's holy people, you're members of God's family members of God's family. One of the things I believe that we need to make sure the world understands when it thinks of the church is the fact that there's still room in the family of God. Do you believe that? There's still room in the family of God. Now, how many of you have ever been to a church where you felt like an outsider no matter how long you were there? You were never really accepted. You never really wondered. You wondered to yourself, hey, do, you know, is, is, is this really, do they really like me or don't they like me? One of the things that we need to be reminded of as a church, as a body of believers, is that in the kingdom of God, the true church, there is still room for people who don't even know us yet. Amen? Amen. Paul says, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, you are citizens along with all God's holy people. And I know that he's talking and using the terminology of Gentiles, and uh, he implies uh, the opposite of Gentiles, which, is, which are the Jews, um, but I believe that for us and for people that are unknown or that, that do not know Christ, um, this same principle very much apply, uh, applies to us and applies to them. The Gentiles were considered the outsiders, okay? And the Jews were considered the insiders. Gentiles, outsiders, Jews were the insiders. Paul is telling the Ephesian people that the, in the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as siders, Insiders or outsiders. He says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. There's still room in God's family is what Paul's saying. We are full members of the family of God in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Paul uses two words here, and they're translated in this version, uh, this translation rather of the Bible, the word stranger and the word foreigner. The word stranger and foreigner. As I was mentioning a little while ago, in Canada, I felt like a stranger and a foreigner, and rightfully so. And uh, John and Leah and their family went to Europe not long ago. Places you felt like a stranger and a foreigner, maybe even the place you were raised in a little bit. 
Um, Paul uses these two words, and it's, it's very significant to look at the words that he uses. The word stranger is xenos in the Greek, and what that means is that there was no real connection to in, the, in the city where they were living. Um, in, in America, and maybe you remember, look back into the Old West days, they would have what was called drifters, right? Drifters, they went from town to town to town, never putting down roots, never building relationships, never, never having any meaningful connection to the community that they lived in. Those were drifters. That's the kind of the word that Paul's using here. And those were the type of people that were people were always suspicious of, and the people in the towns they lived in were always disliking them. And Paul says, you're no longer a stranger when it comes to your connection to the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. Aren't you glad for that? We're no longer drifters. We're no longer strangers. He says, also, we're no longer foreigners. A foreigner was a little bit different. A foreigner was a, an alien, a person who comes from another place and pays certain taxes in order to live as a resident of another place. So they're here, but they're not from here. And we all know what that's like. You ever been someplace when you were there, but you weren't from there? And you would never be accepted as if you were from there? To be honest, uh, I, I had a little fear of that when we moved here. All right? Um, I wasn't sure who lived in Beloit. I wasn't even sure that there was much uh, that, that I knew about Beloit, but I knew one thing as I drove around Beloit. I didn't find many people that looked like me. And I was a little nervous. I thought, what am I going to find? Will they, will they like me? Will they you know, burn a church down because I'm here? I don't, I don't know what this community is like. Thankfully, I found that they do like me. At least they, they make me think that they do. All right? But I've, I felt like a foreigner for a little while. Now I just feel like this is home, right? This is, these, are, these are my, my friends, and I'm meeting more and more people. And, and uh, by the way, it was so, so neat. The other day I took Roman to football practice, and, and uh, a fellow came up to me, and we were talking about uh, Roman and, and, and all the stuff that he, that, with the sports, and his son plays as well. And, and he says, my, nice to meet you. My name's Marvin. And he says, I think I know where you live. He says, we, we farm the field across the road here. So I got to meet the guy that owns that place. And now we know Pete and we know the folks over this way. And now we know the folks across the street. Uh, so it was just really neat to connect with more people. But I'm no longer feeling like a foreigner here, right? And uh, maybe you, you can identify with that. Not just paying taxes for the privilege of living somewhere, uh, but now we are actually part of the community. That's what Paul was saying. Saying you're no longer foreigners uh, you're no longer strangers. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. Now, sometimes you feel like you belong, and sometimes you make yourself feel like you don't belong, right? In the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter how we feel about us. What matters is how God feels about us, okay? There's always room. And one of the reasons that a back to church Sunday like this is so important is that we let the world know consistently that this is not a church with doors in order to keep people out, okay? This is simply a church with doors that are swung open wide for people to come in. We want people to come here, okay? And I believe that everything that we do needs to keep that, we need to keep that in mind, in the forefront of our mind, that the community is welcome here, that they are, uh, we, we want them to be here, and we want them to feel welcomed in this place. When I was growing up, we used to sing a song in, at church, and maybe you recognize these words. Ira Stanfield wrote this song in 1946. The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide, and its grace so free is sufficient for me, and deep is its fountain as wide as the sea. Though millions have found him a friend and have turned from the sins they have sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcomes a sinner before it's too late. The hand of my Savior, I love this verse, the hand of my Savior is strong and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine and rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. And you know the chorus. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. And I believe the message we need to be teaching and preaching and sharing and living before the community around us where God's planted us is that though millions have come, 
there's still room for one. Amen? Amen? There should never, ever, ever be a reason why we should turn people away from the kingdom of God. And, and I'm not saying that we are, but there should never be a reason why someone should turn and walk away because they think, well, there's just no room in that church for me. God help us to realize that there is room. Amen? We're not foreigners. We're not strangers anymore. And neither should they be. Amen? Amen. Paul goes on to say in verse 20, he says together, and he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, those who were outside of God's holy people and those who were inside as God's holy people. He says together, we are his house. Didn't know you were a house, did you? Built on the foundation of all of the apostles and prophets and the cornerstone of Christ Jesus. The cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. So Paul uses a word picture here, an illustration. He says, we are his house house. We are together. And that's the key word there. I want us to not miss that. Okay. Together. Things are often insignificant by themselves, but if you put it together with other things, it makes a big difference. I'll use, uh, I'll, I'll just give you one example. Brownies. <laughs> Don't give me one of those ingredients by itself. I'm not eating the eggs. I don't want the cocoa by itself. I don't want the flour. I don't want the baking powder or whatever else they put in that wonderful, delightful stuff called brownie mix. But you put it together, then you've got something there, right? You've got something. Paul says together, together, we are his house. What's he saying? The people on the inside and all of the people that God's adding, quote unquote, from the outside is bringing up something wonderful, wonderful. Think about this for a moment. 50 years from right now, there may be nobody in this room whose last name is still existing in this church. I'm not saying that you left the church or things were bad or whatever. I'm just saying, look at who God could raise up. 50 churches now because of what God's done here. Why? Because we recognize that together is important. Together. The, the word together is very significant in the Bible. God's word says that we are put together, we're joined together. It tells us we're built together, we're members together, we're heirs together, we're fitted together, we're held together. And one of these days, Paul tells us in Thessalonians that we will be what? Caught up together to forever be with the Lord. It's together, right? And so the church is a place to belong because it's a place where something unique and I believe powerful happens when people come together under the same common denominator of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's building this church. He's building this house, the spiritual building. He says it's built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Okay? This building. And by the way, before we go further, let me just say this. The parts don't validate the body. The, the body validates the parts. Okay? Here's what I mean by that. A hand is not significant without a body. Right? Makes sense, doesn't it? And it matters whose hand it is and whose body it's connected to. For instance, if, if we could bring Picasso back from the dead and somehow bring his hand into this place, it's not going to help us any. Right? His hand needs to be connected to Picasso's body because if you put it to my body or your body, we're probably getting stick figures, right? It matters that it's connected to the body. And so we have to understand that. Look at what Paul said. If you have your Bibles open, you want to look there. Romans chapter 12. In Romans 12, verses three through five, Paul says this. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of others, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. Listen, we are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. The church is a place where we belong and there's something that unique happens when all of the parts come together under the auspice of Christ, okay? So in that belonging, we have a true body. And without that belonging, we don't 
have a true body, okay? So it's very important for us to remember that it's about being together. Paul says, we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles uh, and the prophets. Something else significant about that uh, is that when Paul says the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, we know that what, what was their foundation? What was the foundation of the apostles and the prophets? Essentially, it became the church, right? But it was God. Their life and their lifestyle, the way they lived their life, the ministry of these men became the foundation for uh, the church. Became the foundation for the church. We find uh, there in Revelation chapter 21 that Jesus is showing John the city And in verse 14, it says, The wall of the city has 12 foundation stones, and on them are written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so the foundation of this thing called the church is significant, and uh, we must remember that. So, we are to be together. Paul goes on to say that we are to be growing. We are to be growing. Look at verse 21. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Okay? Carefully joined together. Carefully joined together. What church is Paul talking to here? He's talking to the Ephesian church, right? Remember just a few weeks ago, uh, we, we looked at the Ephesian church that was mentioned in Revelation, and we realized, uh, along with Acts, I believe, Acts chapter 18 and 19, that the church in Ephesus was a church that lived among a lot of pantheism, lots of other gods, lots of other temples. And the main temple that they had in Ephesus was what? The temple of Diana or the temple of Artemis, right? Those are the same people who shouted for hours, great as Artemis or great as Diana of the Ephesians. And so Paul is using as a picture for these people that God is building a temple, but it's not like the temples that you're looking around and seeing. It's a temple that's much different than that. We are the temple of God, both individually and corporately. Even though Artemis or Diana was a centerpiece of the temple that they could see in the church of Ephesus, Paul was reminding them that we, as believers, they as believers were being put together, fitly joined together to become a temple to the Lord. Okay? The apostles were the foundation and Christ is the cornerstone. Now what's a cornerstone do? What's a cornerstone do? You ever see cornerstones? You ever been to a building and they have it engraved on the side, built in our year of the Lord, 18 something or whatever? Um, oftentimes if you see a brick or a stone building, there's a cornerstone. And what that cornerstone does and what makes it significant is the cornerstone ties the other walls in together, right? It's usually a larger stone, and it's up on that, that stone sits up on the foundation, but it ties the walls in together. And what Paul's doing here is he's giving us a picture of the fact that Christ is the only one that can tie Jews and Gentiles together, and he's the only one who can tie people who are part of a church, part of the church, and people who are outside of the church together and make something beautiful. Amen? You ever meet people that you just think to yourself, wow, I don't know if I could be around that person very much. You know what I mean? You ever go to the mall and watch people? Go to Walmart and watch people. That's really fun. They even make videos about that. Uh, it, it's interesting, right? And you look at people and you think to yourself, I have nothing in common with that person. Right? Right? I just have nothing in common. That person's different than me, and, and we, there's nothing that connects us. What Paul is saying is that through the power of Christ, he's the cornerstone that can tie us in with people that we have no idea could ever be part of God's kingdom and see their lives so radically transformed and radically changed that they just become part of the building. Amen? You know you were like that? Did you know that? I was like that? Look at the building of the body of believers that God's built here. I look across this room and I see some families who've been in church their entire life. I see some families who've been in church in recent years of your life. I see some people who have really rough backgrounds and some people who've probably never even gotten a speeding ticket. I'm I'm one of those, by the way. I've never gotten a speeding ticket. 
I'll have one by next Sunday, right? Uh, knock on wood. I'm not superstitious, but if I get one, it's been about time, right? <laughs> yes, my wife says. But think about it. What could have brought us together? Our paths would have never crossed, more than likely, had it not been for a man called Jesus who stretched himself out on the cross. Gail and I would have never met this Texas fellow over here, right, if it wasn't for Jesus. Jennifer, we'd never know you if it wasn't for Jesus. Jeff and Katie wouldn't know you if it wasn't for Jesus, and you wouldn't know me. And we wouldn't like each other more than likely, right, if it wasn't for Jesus. He's the cornerstone, right? He ties us together. And if that ever ceases to be, you take the cornerstone out, the walls fall down, right? When we don't focus on Christ, the walls fall down. And so as we look around and we want to tell the people around us, that, you know, back to church Sunday, come to Jesus, come to God. We want to we bring you in. We have to remind ourselves constantly that the only thing that will keep people tied into the true body of Jesus Christ, or the true body of the church, rather, is Jesus Christ, that cornerstone that holds us together. Lastly, uh, this morning, um, Paul uh, finishes this passage in verse 22, uh, rather verses 21 and 22, and he uses a unique word here. He's not just talking about a building that is growing up, okay? And sometimes we can get that mentality that the church is this building and we have blocks and it's just a building that's going up. That's, that's not the only illustration he uses because look at verse 21. He says, we are carefully joined together. There's the building illustration, right? Becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Becoming, becoming. It's significant to look at that word because the word that he's using there, and actually if, you, if you've memorized these verses in another version, you'll find that uh, the word often used and translated is the word growing. We are growing into a holy temple or a building for the Lord, growing. Buildings don't grow. I wish they would because I'd plant a few. Wouldn't you? Want a new garage? Just throw some seeds in the ground and we'll just wait a few years and see what happens, right? Kids think that's what happens, right? <laughs> that's not true. Buildings are built, but organisms grow. Organisms grow. The church is a great place to belong because the church is always growing. Not just numerically. Right? We can look around and we can see people who weren't here last year at, at uh, uh, Back to Church Sunday. We can look around and say, wow, that, per- that family wasn't even here two years ago or five years ago or seven years ago. But more than growing numerically, the church is always growing in Christ. Right? Let me ask you something. Has your relationship with Christ grown in the past, we'll say, five years? You're not the same Christian you were five years ago. And I hope that it's a positive uh, change there in your walk with Jesus. I'm not the same person I was. And because God is growing us individually, that means that he's also growing us corporately as a body of believers. Paul uses that word oxo, uh, which means growing, which means not staying the same, morphing and becoming what the master desires for us to become. Right? And that's the goal. A lot of the reason people don't come to church, and I don't know, we should just take some time and go around and ask you some of the excuses you've heard for why people don't come to church, why they say they won't come to church. One of the excuses that I've heard is people say, only hypocrites go to church. I've been to church and it's all hypocrites. I like to tell them that uh, if you go to church and, it's all, and you don't go to church because there's hypocrites there, then stop going to the gym because there's fat people there. Right? We're, we're all needy people, aren't we? Anybody here perfect? If you're perfect, uh, you, you just messed our church up because we were batting a thousand before you walked in, right? None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. And you know what we need to tell the world around us? We need to tell them that none of us are perfect, right? Bob? Bob? Yeah, they're trying, exactly. But what I'm saying is being transparent to the world outside is a good thing. It's not a weak thing, right? 
Letting them know that, hey, we're not perfect individuals. And that doesn't give us an excuse to not try. It doesn't give us an excuse to come to church and live totally different Monday through Saturday and come to church and act like we're somebody totally different, right? That's not an excuse to do that. But it is good for the world around us to look at a church and say, you know what? That guy's for real, you know? He's having a tough day at work today, and, I, and he actually admitted he didn't walk around just quoting scriptures and acting like nothing was wrong. You ever meet people like that, the super saved people? Michael Jr. reminds me, it reminds me of his uh, comedy thing about people who are, who are super saved or, or greatly saved or something like that. Something like that. Um, we, we can act like that to the world. We can act like nothing's ever wrong, but that's not going to reach them, okay? We don't need to always be down in the mouth. We need to be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. But at the same time, we can let the world around us know that uh, here you don't have to be perfect. You simply have to be willing to grow in Christ. Amen. Paul says, through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Where does God live? Six million dollar question. In our heart? Everywhere? You want to you find something fun to do, just ask a three or four year old that. Where does God live? Wow, this just blows their mind. Those answers are true. In our heart, he is everywhere. He's omnipresent. There's never a place that God isn't. Put it this way. There's never, a, there's never a time that God is closer to something than he was before. Okay? He's always there. But yet Paul says, through Jesus, we, all of us, you and me, imperfect humans, are also being made part of this dwelling place where God lives by his what? Spirit. Spirit. Where's God's spirit? I believe God's spirit is found any place people are willing to be part of the body of Christ. Amen? God's building a house. God's building a temple. God's building a building and he's building an organism and it's growing and it's alive. It's not just going this way, but it's going this way. And we get to be part of that. The church is a place to belong because we need more help. Amen? I believe that what God has for us in this community isn't going to be accomplished just by the people that are sitting in this room. Do you believe that? Most of us were reached by somebody outside of a church service, probably. Okay? In other words, the church left the building. Right? Something Elvis used to say, right? Elvis has left the building. They said about, oh, Elvis has left the building. Well, the church left the building, and more than likely, that's why most of us have been exposed to the gospel. I'm, I can't remember which church it was, but I've been to a church that as you leave the sanctuary, leave the assembly part of the church, there's a sign that says you are now entering your mission field as you leave the church. I love that. Because you know what's going to reach the community and let them become a part of this building that God's building, this body that God's building? It's when the church leaves the building, Right? When the church is the church outside of the church, that's what the world needs. You believe that? The world needs to hear it, and the world needs to know it, and the world needs to understand that we haven't arrived yet, and their doors are not closed. In fact, we're not even getting close. Amen? There's a, I, I have a pet peeve. I'll just share it with you. Is that all right? Uh, I'm going to share it anyway. One of my pet peeves is going to a business and it's not even time to close yet. It's like five minutes before it's time to close. And I understand, I've been, I've been a part of a business before and I hated it when people would walk in at the last moment. Anybody ever been there? Frustrating. Some of you have been, yep, Katie's raising her hand. She's, I'm in trouble. I, I saw Jeff back there going, no, no, don't do it. It's not worth it. <laughs> But one of my pet peeves is going especially, I'll just, I'll use a restaurant, not a trailer company, <laughs> is, is going into a restaurant and there's say 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, and you just want to go order food, even if it's for takeout, and they say, sorry, we're closed. Isn't that frustrating? Hey, man, that, that drives me crazy. 24-hour-a-day restaurants were a gift sent from heaven. No. But it's frustrating to me. 
for me, I've, I've owned a business before, and, I, and when, I, when I see that, and when I see employees acting that way, all I can think of is my, in my mind is you'd be fired, you'd be fired, and you'd be fired. Because why? Who's the most important person in that room? The customer. And if I owned the business, I would be so frustrated that they were so selfish to say, we're going to close early just so that we can walk out at exactly the right time, and it doesn't really matter what the customers think, and they just lost money in business and potential future business, Right? I wonder how many times people come into contact with, even if it's just a moment of time, whether outside of the church or inside the church, (coughs) and we put off this aura as, sorry, we're closed, we're kind of full, kind of busy, and uh, it's really not not any room for you here. You know what I want God to do in my heart and my life? I want to be that employee that says, you know what, even if I've got to stay late, I want them to know that we're open. Amen? I want them to know that the kingdom of God is wide open for them, even if it's going to be messy. And I believe one of the main reasons why churches don't reach into the communities is because it's messy. Right? The other day I was, uh, I was, uh, had had a lot going on and it was just, just, just a lot going on. And uh, I was so mentally tired and it wasn't even lunchtime yet. You ever been there? It's like, I just want to get back in bed go to sleep, cover my head up, close the blinds, muzzle the kids, you know, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I literally walked in, the, walked in the house. It was almost lunchtime. And I told my wife, I said, I'm just going to lay down for a moment. I'm just exhausted mentally and, and just don't feel like I can go another minute without a nap or something. And so I, I literally walked into my room, laid down on the bed. Roman comes in and says, Dad, someone's here to see you. And I just thought, oh, no, not now, please. So I came back outside and talked for about a half an hour with the individual and was trying to help them. And, and I just thought to myself, you know what? Working with people is messy. It's hard work, right? It costs you a lot. And that's the reason why most people don't do it. That's the reason why most Christians can come to church week after week after week after week and never take the time to share the gospel with somebody because they know that if they do that, it's more than likely going to cost them some time, maybe some money, a lot of emotional uh, 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 emotional energy that they don't really want to invest and so therefore we come to church and we look around and we wonder who has been willing to do that and we can re- just rejoice with them well let me tell you something God wants us to tell the world that there's room and God wants us to open our hearts and our eyes and say God even if I got to stay longer even if it cost me the world and a nap a nap yeah <laughs> a nap too uh, I, I thought you said app I'm thinking that'd be a good app there we go but even if it costs us, there's room. Church is a place to belong. In church, we've got to act like it, okay? Not just on Sunday. Let's act like it. Let's let the world know we're open, right? And we're not closing until the, until the boss says we're closed. And there's always room. There's always room. I look around, I see a lot of empty seats. Some of them are filled downstairs with kids. But you know what? We haven't maxed out this facility yet. I believe that God's going to bring us more and more people. And when he brings those people, I believe he's going to provide the need for us to have even more room so that his kingdom can grow. His kingdom can grow. Amen. Church is a place to belong. I hope you feel like you belong. And I challenge you. Let's take the message that Paul had in Ephesians and let the world know. We're not strangers anymore. Not foreigners anymore. Let's not act like it. You're in. Amen? You're in. That's what the world wants. They want to be part of something. Let's let them be part of God's kingdom. All right? Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father, thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for this passage of Scripture that uh, challenges my heart. And uh, it blesses me as well. And I believe it should bless all of us and challenge all of us. Uh, Lord, I I thank you for uh, the, the mission field that you've given us all around here. Several live in different, different communities than where we go to church. But God, wherever you've planted us, wherever we spend the majority of our time is a place that, God, you've ordained for us to reach people with the gospel. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, today, as Back to Church Sunday has been celebrated here, that it wouldn't stop. That, Lord, as a result of what's taken place today and from your word and uh, the emphasis upon this day, that, God, we would all be refreshed and renewed in our vision and our passion 
to reach the world around us, no matter what it costs us, and uh, no matter how inconvenient it is, no matter what we have to set aside in our own even personalities in order to say, God, if you will, if you will help me to see what you want me to do and give me the courage, I will do it in order to see your kingdom grow. We thank you, Lord, and uh, we look forward and we believe already that you will help us and our faith reaches beyond uh, our understanding at this moment and uh, we trust you to give us power and give us strength to do so. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen.